This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of February 5th, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on Tuesdays from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as on the projects page on national blog site medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, before reviewing our top three, we start our discussion by outlining presentations we made Tuesday of this week before the Kenai Peninsula Borough Assembly. For those interested, the slide deck we used with those presentations are available on our Facebook and Twitter feeds. Then we move on to our top three. First is the impact of the upcoming supplemental budget on overall FY20 spending levels. It mostly wipes out the progress made in last year's budget cuts. Second, we discuss the claims by some that the governor isn't providing leadership this session on fiscal issues. We disagree in part. And third, we discuss a report last week from the DC-based Tax Foundation attempting, similarly to last year's report from the Ohio-based Buckeye Institute, to justify a statewide sales tax over an income tax as a means of raising new revenue. And now, let's join Michael. But before we even get into the weekly top three, Brad is down in an undisclosed secret location down in the Kenai Peninsula. He's uh, going to meet with the power brokers. I, I, every time I think about it, I think it must be like the war room in Strange Love. You know, I mean, kind of like here, here's Brad with a light shining up from below kind of thing. Uh, Brad, what's happening down in the Kenai this morning? <laughs> well, let, let, let me be clear. I'm in the Uptown Motel, so I'm not in an undisclosed location. Um, so Mayor Pierce asked me to come down and uh, and do a couple of things uh, during the day. Dwayne Bannock uh, from KSRM and I had talked about uh, uh, doing a, a show on uh, or doing a piece on his sound off show uh, that's on uh, that's on the Kenai in the mornings, and I'm going to do that this morning at 10 o'clock. Mayor Pierce is on at 9 o'clock for those that might be listening to that. Uh, and then this afternoon at 2:30, I'm going to address the finance committee of the uh, Kenai Peninsula uh, Assembly. Um, and then um, and then this evening at 6 o'clock, I address the, uh, the uh, full assembly. Basically, what Mayor Pierce has in mind is that, uh, is that as the uh, assembly gets ready to address their budgets, uh, they have in mind what's going on with the state budget. And I think this is part of uh, uh, getting ready for that, so hearing different perspectives and hearing uh, different uh, uh, takes on where the state budget is. So it's a fairly full day, uh, 10 o'clock with Dwayne on KSRM, uh, uh, 2.30 before the Finance Committee, and then 6 o'clock uh, tonight before the full assembly. So tell us, Brad, what are you going to be covering down there in Kenai as you go through there? What you know, what's your what's your syllabus look like? What's are you you schooling people? Are you talking about a specific subject? What's going on? Well, I'm going to throw the the slide deck uh, uh, up on uh, up on our website and the Facebook page here uh, uh, a little later this morning once I once I do the last uh, tweak on it. But basically, it's an overview of where we've been um, and and where we're headed. The the scope, uh, the bullet points are where we've been, where we're headed, what are the options. What is the impact of the various options on the Alaska economy and families? And then outlining a balanced approach, which, frankly, you and I are going to talk about to some degree um, in the second segment. The where we've been is basically looking over the last 10 years and, um, and saying, look, you know, we started out the decade in fairly good shape. Oil prices were high. Uh, but then we, we ran basically a $20 billion deficit uh, that we pulled from savings. Uh, the CBR, the SBR, uh, and uh, and permanent fund dividends uh, at the in the latter part of the decade, where we're headed, uh, 
Uh, we've got a billion eight in uh, in deficits per year on average uh, over the next 10 years. What are the options? Uh, it's basically the the ICER options that they've talked about since this we've talked about since 2016. But here's here's the point I'm going to stress. What's the impact of the various options? On the Alaska economy and families, when people look at the options, they tend to say they tend to think, "Oh, each of these options are are equal." So we just pick an option. We can just pick one of these options, whichever one we can get, you know, 51% behind, uh, and use it. For example, PFD cuts, uh, and and we'll just take PFD cuts and we'll and we'll fund the budget with that, and and we're done. The problem is, or the challenge is, not all of the options are equal. Uh, as you and I have talked on the show, PFD cuts have the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy and on Alaska families of all of the options. It's the worst option to take. There are other options that are that have a lower impact on the Alaska economy and have a lower impact uh, on Alaska families and are more, more equitable uh, to all Alaskans. And I think where people lose um, uh, focus is is on the impact of the options. So I'm going to spend uh, a, a fair amount of time uh, talking about the impact of the options, and then I'm going to come back and talk about what the governor's uh, uh, the the six scenarios in the governor's um, uh, uh, OMB ten year plan are, uh, and then talk about scenario five, which is the balanced approach, sort of the all 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 of the above. Uh, approach. This would be kind of a fun thing to do around the state to kind of visit with people and get that perspective out there. I know you and I had talked about maybe doing something like that in the future. So as the uh, session goes out, maybe we should uh, maybe we should rehash that and come back to that. And we maybe we could get one down in Homer. Maybe we could get one up in Fairbanks. It'd be kind of an interesting be kind of an interesting thing to do, I, I, I think, for sure. Uh, so we'll, sure. we'll have to see what we can do here. Uh, All right, so first things first, um, number one on your weekly top three has to do with it's all about that base. It's all about the base of the budget. Uh, Last year we fought, we died, we scraped, we cried. It was a whole horrible deal. But in the long run, did we really accomplish anything? And, of course, I'm talking about this supplemental budget, this monster supplemental budget that's supposed to be coming in here. Give us your thoughts on this. Well, the numbers are sort of staggering. Uh, James Brooks uh, has a great article on it uh, in the ADN. It was published about four days ago. The headline on it is Alaska Legislators Expect Colossal Supplemental Spending Gobbling Last Year's Budget Cuts. And then he goes through and analyzes what's going on. Uh, Basically, there are a number of ways you can get at this number, but basically, Uh, He takes the view that lawmakers and the governor collectively cut between the vetoes and and lawmakers and and legislators cuts uh, that we cut about three hundred and fifty one million dollars from uh, from the operating budget last year. And then he talks about the uh, uh, the uh, supplemental uh, that many anticipate uh, is going to be huge when the governor proposes it uh, later this week, I think, or next week. Um, and and adding up what people have talked about, the pieces that people have talked about, uh, is uh, uh, James puts it at those additions are expected to mean 250 million to 300 million more spending than was planned uh, last year. So 351 cut uh, last year, and now with the supplemental uh, adding back 200 to 250 to 300 million, uh, uh, leaving a net. Uh, cut uh, last year after all of the sound and fury, after all of the problems, after all of the, uh, after all of the, uh, uh, the, the, the drum rolls and, and, and uh, headaches and screaming, uh, a net cut of about $50 million. And as James points out, that fi- even that figure could get, could get smaller. The supplemental could get uh, larger. There's uh, uh, a couple of things that uh, could happen that could uh, bring that number up. One in particular is that the Alaska Supreme Court still has pending before it uh, the the case involving uh, the effort to issue debt to cover the uh, oil and gas taxes, the oil and gas tax credits that the state owes from a former program. If, as I've urged in the past, the the Supreme Court uh, uh, reverses uh, that bun- that uh, that uh, bonding decision or that bonding approach 
uh, and puts it back into the operating budget, that could add another $100 million to the, to the uh, supplemental, uh, bringing it uh, on net above, uh, re- uh, resulting in last year's spending being above the prior year's spending as a result of the supplemental. But I, so, thought, I thought we were all going to die, Brad. I thought it was all puppies and butterflies being murdered in the streets and the world was ending. That's what I heard. Well, I mean, it shows you, uh, yes, it, it, but it shows you that even with the cuts uh, that ultimately made it through, even with the, the cuts to the university and even with the cuts to uh, AMH, AMSHS, the, 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 the ferry system, uh, even with all of those cuts, uh, we still may end up with an increase uh, in spending. And basically, this goes back to the governor's, to, to another point the governor has made, uh, which is we have these mandatory spending programs, these formula-driven programs that are driving the budget up year after year after year, sort of regardless of, 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 of what's happening uh, elsewhere. You, you try to make, uh, uh, you try to go in and make budget cuts, you try to go in and, and, and bring spending down, and the formula programs just keep, uh, just keep driving it up. So it's, I mean, we're, we're facing, <laughs> in, in some respects, uh, we gained a little bit last year. We may be about to give it all back, uh, and and even with some. Um, and and I think that just really brings a spotlight to these formula driven programs that uh, that the governor has uh, has identified. We've got the same thing at the federal level: the mandatory spending programs, Medicaid, Medicare, uh, Social Security, uh, continually are driving the uh, uh, the federal budget up. Uh, revenues aren't keeping pace with it. The deficit's increasing because of those mandatory formula-driven spending programs. That's that's a problem at the federal level. We've got the same problem at the state level with uh, with our formula programs. Uh, Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, we're talking about the deficits and uh, the excuse me, the supplemental budget uh, and wh- how well, you know what it means moving forward. And we've talked about that, Brad. The governor mentioned this the other day. To a hundred, how was it? Hundred and nine million dollars, I think. Just on, if nothing else changed, if nothing else happened, it would be a hundred and nine million dollars a year, every year, adding on. And of course, that compounds, right? It's a compounding power. Uh, and so, I mean, in ten years, the budget would just automatically escalate to another billion dollars, uh, maybe nine years, uh, another billion dollars, simply based on these. Formula-driven funds, the the increased cost of labor and everything else. I mean, there's some stuff baked in there that we've really got to get a handle on. It, it, it exactly right, Michael. I mean, we, we don't have we don't the budget's not driven by revenues. The Alaska state budget is driven by spending, and, and you know, this in part goes back to the debate we've had about if we impose a spending cap, do we want it uh, driven off spending or do we want it driven off revenues? I think this highlights the problem with 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 driving it off spending. Spending just keeps going up uh, in this state under the formula driven programs. It you know when people say oh we got to account for inflation we can't you know we can't just keep we can't keep pace not keep pace with inflation uh, that just keeps driving spending up spending up further and further and further and our revenues aren't doing that. Our revenues have gone uh, down uh, uh, dramatically. Uh, exposing this huge this huge budget gap, um, and and we just if we just keep those those formula driven programs on the track they are now going up and up and up, uh, we're just going to keep widening the gap uh, that we're dealing with. Even after all of the and I and I think the supplemental budget, uh, frankly, highlights it. Even after all of the effort we made last year, all of the gnashing of teeth, all of the uh, 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 arguments, all of the, all of the, you know, back and forth that occurred a- uh, over it. Even after all that, uh, we are very close to just breaking even uh, with prior year spending, and and may in fact exceed it, uh, d- depending upon uh, what happens in the Supreme Court with the oil and gas tax credit case. So, it's, um, it, it, I think it highlights highlights a lot about what the governor has said about these formula programs. The, the, prob- the problem is nobody's come up with the solution to the formula program. So, I mean, the governor's highlighted the correct issue, but he's not proposed legislation on how to deal with these formula programs. Um, and the legislature doesn't look like they're headed toward addressing uh, the formula-driven programs. And so we're just on this track of, you know, everybody – 
pointing out or the governor pointing out that that's a problem, but nobody coming up with solutions to the problem. And, and that, that's a, that's a, that's a problem in and of itself because we'll just keep having this, this, these, this, this driving force of the, of the formula driven programs keep escalating the budget, uh, uh, while we're, you know, while we're talking about how, how big a problem it is. Uh, you know, and, and this, I think, is actually a pretty good segue. I mean, I want to, well, I, I definitely want to get into your number two, talking about leadership and, and some of the other things and, and taking the, you know, taking the bull by the horns. But really, uh, I would say that at this point, to, in my mind, the lion's share of the blame for these issues is laying at the feet of the legislature because they're the ones that have, uh, I mean, they're the ones that have just been kicking and, you know, dragging their feet, kicking and screaming uh, these last two years towards any kind of fiscal discipline, uh, any kind of reductions. You know, again, it, it immediately becomes, well, we just can't do that. We just can't cut. We can't do it. People would be hurt. Infrastructure would crumble. Uh, you know, the, the like I said, the world as we know it would end if we do these things. But there really is, I mean, there's there's no other options on the table. I mean, I I guess they see the only option as being the taking of the permanent fund, whereas those of us who would like to see the permanent fund continue as it is statutorily um, are kind of like, well, you, you've got to cut more, but there's just there's no middle ground between these two positions. There's not, because everybody's viewing it, I think, uh, sort of in, in, in isolation. You can't cut... I mean, the argument is you can't cut the university, you can't cut education, you can't do this. Frankly, I think the solution, and we'll get into this in the second segment, but I, I think the solution is sort of a all of the above solution. Everybody, everybody's going to have to take some. Uh, the university's already taken some. It needs to take more. It's already on track to take more. K through 12, frankly, needs to take some. Uh, Medicaid uh, needs to take some. And on the revenue side, everybody needs to be needs to have some skin in the game um, uh, in order to uh, offset this, uh, in order to increase revenues and sort of sort of come to a solution in the middle where we have some budget cuts and some and some revenue increases. It, the people avoid that by saying, you know, picking on the particular and saying, oh, you can't cut K through 12 or you can't cut. Uh, uh, the university, and I'm going to stand on my ground, and, and I'm just not going to let you do uh, either of those things. When in, and, and as long as we have 60 legislators, and each one picks a program and says you can't cut that state arts funding, art, art funding for the arts, state arts council. As long as you can't cut that, uh, we're never going to get to a solution. It's going to be an all of the above uh, solution uh, uh, to, to, to get us to to get us to some sort of, of landing point. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, people just don't want to admit that. They just want to protect their little empire and say, you can't do that. Um, and say, everybody, you, everybody else, you need to cut. But my empire, uh, you don't need to, you can't touch that. As long as we're going down that track, we're never, we're never going to get to a solution. On to number two, where we talk about leadership. Uh, and this comes from a uh, op-ed piece by Larry Persilli. Uh, in the ADN, where he criticizes the governor for his lack of leadership. Uh, meanwhile, lauding the legislature for at least trying to take a stand on, uh, well, I mean, by apparently by cutting the dividend. That's what he wants to laud them for. Brad, what's uh, what's your take on this? I think the governor deserves a lot of credit, Michael, uh, for providing leadership uh, on fiscal issues in this respect. I think the OMB 10-year plan which the, which the administration provided at the time it provided the budget uh, back in December, is an excellent outline of the options that, uh, that the state has uh, to solve uh, the current fiscal crisis. There are, uh, they're, they're, they're numbered one through five, but, but four has a four A and B. Um, and so there's really six options out there when you count that four A and four B. There's really six options that are uh, in the in the OMB plan, and I think those are excellent. I think they they do a great job describing the the various alternatives that the state uh, has going forward. And I think the governor deserves a lot of credit. The administration deserves a lot of credit for putting for putting that ten year plan out there and and defining the options. If I were the governor, uh, every speech I gave. Um, and and if I were OMB, every presentation I gave before the uh, before the legislature would be around the ten-year plan and say, look, here are the options. And we all know what the problem is. 
here are the options on how to, on, on how to solve it. Um, and let's start talking about those. And let's talk about the strengths and the weaknesses of each. And let's start as and as Alaskans, let's start narrowing down uh, on which which option uh, we think Alaska ought to be ought to take going forward. And the options are fairly well defined in terms of how you play them out over the ten years. Um, and they result in, in in balanced budgets. They each result in a balanced budget. Um, and and have the discussion center around those options that are that are in his 10-year plan. I think that would be a great way of, of focusing the discussion uh, in the state. It would get everybody to read the 10-year plan, which they ought to be doing. It would get everybody talking about those scenarios, um, and, and, I, and we could poll on the scenarios. I think it would be a great way of focusing the discussion. So I think the governor has, has done a great job in terms of his OMB has done a great job in terms of putting together those scenarios and putting together that plan and putting together what, what you have to do under each of those scenarios to get to the solution of, uh, of a balanced budget. Um, where I, so, so, so I give him a lot of credit for that. The problem is he's not, he's not followed through on that. It's, it, you know, you can't see that leadership coming through because he's not using the 10-year plan, he's not using those scenarios uh, in his discussions uh, of the issues. And, and I think, so it's, there's a lot of leadership there, but, but sometimes it's hard to detect it because he's not following through with it uh, and, and, and leading the discussion uh, down those scenarios. I have a favorite in those scenarios. Uh, I think there's one particular uh, scenario that, that, that best serves uh, the state and and, uh, and, and industry and, and, and our citizens. Others will have will think other uh, solutions uh, in those scenarios are appropriate. Uh, but we ought to have that's where the discussion ought to be. And I think uh, uh, so I credit the governor for putting together that, 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 that plan and putting together those scenarios. but I am having problems in, in, uh, in the follow through uh, of having done that and, uh, and, and, and using that as the base to have the discussion. Uh, Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, you know he's gun shy. I mean, I think I think that's a I think that's an appropriate term to use at this point, Brad. He is very gun shy when it comes to uh, what's going on. I mean, you saw what happened last year. I mean, albeit what Persili has said that he's just you know not showing leadership, and why can't he just offer us solutions? He offered you a whole bunch of solutions last year, and immediately you took you know clubs and pitchforks and tar, and you beat the hell out of him for a year uh, for offering some solutions. I mean, you you laud him for the comments on Alaska can't do this anymore. We can't go any further. This is the end of the road. You laud him for all those things. Yet last year when he offered solutions, you know, you, you castigated him. So, I mean, what, you know, at this point, burn me once, burn me twice. I mean, it should, it's not unexpected. Yeah, it's not unexpected, but I think the governor could through the scenarios could, could lead that conversation that, that gets us, uh, gets us to a solution. The other, the other problem I have with, with Larry's piece in particular is, it, it's very one solution biased. It is, it is my my solution using putting myself in Larry's shoes for a moment, in Larry's voice. My solution is PFD cuts. That's what I think we ought to do. Right. So fund it all. Fund it all through PFD cuts. And 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 so you sort of criticize anybody who's not saying that. For, for lack of leadership, because they're not taking your position. I mean, I hear other people say, oh, we got to do it through cuts only. The only way we can do this is through spending cuts, and anybody who's not adopting that is, is, is not showing uh, the leadership or not, not, not really addressing the problem. Other people say we got to do it all through taxes. You know, the, the oil initiative says we, all got, we, we should do it through, all through oil taxes, and anybody who's not saying that. It, it, it's, this, it's, this, it's this blinding uh, everybody's sort of getting in their corner and saying my solution is the only solution. Everybody else, anybody who thinks other than that, uh, is 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 not is not participating, is not is not thinking about it the right way. That sort of that sort of narrow focus, I think, is has been our undoing. And and to some degree, that was the governor's focus last year. It was a narrow focus on cuts only. We're going to do this through uh, through cuts only. I think scenario five, which is a balance of cuts, and they're huge cuts. I mean, we're talking $600 million a year uh, below spending plus inflation, reducing 
uh, uh, the spending plus inflation, inflation line, another $600 million. So that's six, it includes $600 million a, a year in cuts. It includes PFD restructuring to go to POMV 5050, and it includes some new taxes, about $500 million in new taxes. I think that approach where everybody gives a little, but we get at the end uh, a solution to a, uh, an ultimate solution to the fiscal situation is the right way to go, but but we need to have the discussion that sort of drives everybody there, and and people need to understand there's more than just their one scenario out there, and they need to understand what the implications are of all these scenarios. So, if I were the governor, and 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 where I fault him is not leading that conversation, not using the OMB piece which I think is a terrific piece, a terrific baseline to have this discussion among Alaskans, not using that piece as the centerpiece uh, of, of his presentations and saying, look, everybody read this. Let's have the conversation around these six scenarios. There's just a late comment came in, and I'd like to get your take on it, because I know there are many Alaskans out there who feel this way. Matt just commented in the chat room, and he said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry merely knowing that there are solutions isn't leadership. Nobody in the legislature or the governor's office is actually offering a conservative solution that they're willing to carry the argument for or fight for. Saying, well, we'll have a discussion and everything's on the table isn't leadership. I think people actually voted for this governor because they thought he'd fight for them for the full PFD on the budget against taxes. Without leadership, Alaska is lost. And I think this is kind of my take on this is that this is the uh, this is kind of the cuts only approach, which I'm a huge fan of. I mean, I'm kind of in that camp. Uh, but at the same time, I'm realizing that because we don't have the political will and support to make that happen, that, uh, you know, all these other options on the table, we have to start look, casting around looking for some other solution because obviously the cuts only approach is not working with the current makeup that we have right now in the legislature. Yeah, we have to we have to we have to keep in mind that the governor couldn't get 16, even 16 in the legislature, 16 out of 60 to, to back him up on on the kind of of spending cuts that he initially proposed uh, last year, the, the the deep cuts, the cuts only approach that he proposed last year, he couldn't get 16 out of 60 to back him up. We ended up, we ended up, he ended up with a much watered down version, uh, extremely watered down version of that by the end. Even even his first round of vetoes didn't get back to the cuts only. It it, it was about 700 million. Uh, I forget the exact figure, six hundred million higher than where he had started. He sort of gave up on cuts only, uh, even in the first round of, even in the first round of vetoes. It's, I mean, we we can keep going. So 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 leadership means you recognize reality, right? Right. Um, and so if you keep going down this road of cuts only, you're going to keep getting bucked by the legislature. And where does that end up? It ends up in PFD cuts, because with without. Without getting to a budget through cuts only, last year what happened was they just took it out of the PFD. And continuing to go down to that road, even though you're arguing cuts only, what it really results in is is, is PFD cuts only uh, as a funding mechanism. So I think, I think the gov- governor's right to back up and sort of restart the process and say, here's the scenarios, let's have a discussion about the scenarios and start narrowing down to, uh, to, uh, to a single scenario going forward. All right. Well, let's move on then now to talk about number three. Uh, Number three of the weekly top three uh, leads us uh, right on down to uh, some of the solutions. You've talked about uh, your solution is a flat tax. Uh, Again, others are taking the strictly cuts routine. Others now are talking more and more about uh, an oil and gas tax with the initiative out there. But there's also this idea of a sales tax and the Tax Foundation, which is, uh, I guess, part of the policy form, is going uh, is trying to take another stab at the uh, sales tax. Uh, give us your take yeah. on. It. So the tax. Th- this is an important read, and I think and I think people ought to ought to look it up. The Tax Foundation, which is actually a DC based uh, organization, the Tax Foundation is one of the the more respected uh, right of center. Uh, policy institutes in D.C. that looks largely at federal issues, but also looks at state issues, uh, has has done a new study. Uh, it was released on January 30th. It's called "Navigating Alaska's Fiscal Crisis," and I think it's I think it's an important uh, an important piece that that, that people ought to uh, pay attention to. Um, it, um, it it 
it, it when they when they're posting it, they're posting hashtag Alaska Policy Forum, uh, which makes me think that it's been done either in conjunction with or uh, uh, initiated by the Alaska Policy Forum. There's no indication of why the tax foundation, the D.C.-based tax foundation, would otherwise be looking at Alaska, uh, but it's uh, but but that appears to be the tie, and that reminds me of last year's Buckeye Institute. Uh, 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 piece uh, analysis that was done by the Buc- Buckeye Institute out of uh, out of Ohio that was done with Alaska Policy Forum that sort of reached the same conclusions that uh, that a sales tax is the is the is the right way to go. My problem uh, with the sales tax is that it's a regressive uh, approach. It 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 impacts lower uh, middle and lower income Alaska families harder, takes more from them. Uh, as a percent of income than it takes from uh, the top 20 percent um, and is sort of PFD cut light. It's sort of the, the top 20 percent fallback position. Um, but it, yep. it's an important piece that people ought to read. Uh, well, and again, that's part of the challenge that you've had uh, with some of the other forms of taxation as well as the inequity of it. Uh, and we've had discussions about that. Maybe one of these days we'll suss it out again and talk about several different sources of revenue in one show. Maybe we can uh, reach that. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you, my friend. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.